Uh, everybody's very welcome to the next IEHE virtual grand rounds. Um, very much welcome Midlands Regional Hospital presenting today. I encourage people to spread the word. We think these are going to be very worthwhile. We've had to pause them, unfortunately, because of the both pandemic and the malware attack. So we're up and rolling again on a monthly basis. Really, the idea behind this is to try and make sure that there's communication and links between the various hospitals in the group and indeed beyond that among the other groups which I think may be a way of administrating Sloan's care. So on that note, I'm handing over to Moss, and we're going to go two presentations today from Monagar. Over to you, Tomas. Yeah, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, it'd be nice if everybody just identified them, them, their name fully, but also their institution. So if you, if you can just change your name on your, go to your participants on your Zoom call and, and just change your name and put in where you're uh, calling from and what your role is. Um, and as Tim said, this, this should be our ninth uh, I, Grand Rounds this year, but unfortunately uh, we've been stymied by other factors, but we're delighted to take it up again and to have some very interesting cases involving patients who are transferred between IEHG hospitals. And uh, the first case is a surgical case and is going to be presented by Dr. Zara, Zara Kennedy, um, former Matter intern, SPR in general surgery, who was working in Mullingar and currently in St. Michael's, and Mr. Des Toomey, who's a consultant colorectal and general surgeon appointed to the Matter and Mullingar in 2014, uh, former RCSI graduate Irish trainee with a fellowship in colorectal surgery in Hull. So I'll hand over to uh, Zara to start the presentation. Thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction, uh, Dr. Bresen. Um, so the case we're presenting is a previously healthy 43-year-old male presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. The pain was sudden onset, localised to the epigastric region and it radiated down to the umbilicus. Prior to this admission, he had been admitted to the AMAU for a chest pain workup following a bout of influenza. He was a smoker with a 13 pack year history. He was a non-drinker. He took no regular medications, had no known drug allergies and had an, an insignificant surgical and medical history. On arrival, his vital signs were stable. However, he was hypertensive. His examination findings showed his abdomen was soft. However, he had marked tenderness in the epigastric region. He was not rigid or guarding. He had no hernia and his bowel signs were positive. His initial panel of bloods revealed elevated white cells neutrophils, urea, and lactate. He also had a hypercholesterolemia, which was previously undiagnosed. His urine diff was trace blood and one plus protein. He had a CT of his abdomen, and you can see in this axial view of his upper abdomen that the SMA was hypodense after the origin, raising the possibility of thrombus and narrowing. The large bowel was normal. The small bowel was also unremarkable with no dilatation or evidence of any wall thickening. The following day, he went on to have a CT angiogram of the mesenteric vessels, which showed that the superior mesenteric artery was narrowed. However, it was not atherosclerotic in appearance. Here's reconstructed images of his aorta and the branches, once again, highlighting the SMA narrowing just after the origin. The one on the left is with bones, one on the right is without. His case was discussed with vascular in the Matter Hospital and his images were re reviewed at their weekly MDT. The conclusion from this MDT was that he had a vasculitis and they advised a vasculitic screen, which as you can see on this slide here, was all negative. He was commenced on therapeutic tinsaparin and was given IV steroids. On day eight, he was discharged home on a tapering dose of oral prednisolone and rivaroxaban 20 milligrams once a day. We had arranged a CT angiogram for him in two weeks following his discharge to ensure that the vasculitis, which was our working diagnosis at the time, was resolving. However, 10 days following his discharge, he represented to our emergency department in Mullingar. He had developed severe postprandial pain and his white cells were elevated at 13.5. His CRP was normal and his lactate was normal. He had a repeat CT angiogram, which showed stenosis of greater than 50% in the proximal superior mesenteric artery just beyond the origin. It was normal thereafter for two centimetres, and it was occluded just after the origin of the middle colic artery. Again, this, this is a reconstructed image showing same. 
And here is the schematic uh, diagram, which can show the 50% stenosis just after the origin of the superior mesenteric artery, and then the complete stenosis just after um, the middle colic artery. On this admission, he was once again um, given IV steroids. He was commenced on a heparin infusion, and he was placed on bowel rest and given TPN. After a few days, we trialed some oral nutritional, nutritional supplementation. However, he developed mesenteric angina. He was discussed at the matter GI MDT, and he was accepted for transfer under the gastroenterology team for medical management. On admission in the matter, his case was rediscussed with rheumatology for a further opinion, and the working diagnosis at this time was most likely an unusual vasculitis. Following this admission, he was discharged from the matter on tapering steroids and low molecular weight heparin. One month later, however, he represented, so this was April 2019, he represented to the matter. Uh, emergency department shocked. He had an acute abdomen, he was septic, and in the emergency department he required inotropic supports. He had a CT abdomen pelvis and a CT angiogram which showed portal ven venous gas with ileocecal ischemia, and here's an axial image of this CT highlighting the portal venous gas. He went on to have a laparotomy under the care of Professor Stokes, and it was noted at laparotomy that he had an ischemic ileum and cecum. He required an ileocecal resection with sparing of the ascending colon and hepatic flexure. He had a double barrel stoma formed with the jejunum on one limb, lumen and the ascending colon on the other. 200 centimetres of small bowel remained in situ from the DJ flexure. His histology showed that he had an ischemic necrosis suggestive of a low flow state with no evidence of any vasculitis or thrombosis. The disease, as I showed you previously, was in the proximal SMA, which was not resected, so we did not have a histological diagnosis. The histology was discussed, his histology and imaging was once again discussed at the GI matter MDT, and a CT diagnosis of segmental arterial mediolysis um, was formed by Dr. Bolster, uh, who is a consultant radiologist in the matter. So to, to discuss what segment, segmental arterial mediolysis is, so it's a non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory and non-immune arteriopathy of unknown etiology. This case highlights the difficulty in diagnosing this condition and the importance of cl clinician awareness. The most common acute presentation is abdominal pain as it frequently involves the splanchnic vessels but the carotid and retroperitoneal arteries have also been reported. The pathology of segmental arterial mediolysis consists of several phases. So there's the initial insult followed by the remodeling and restoration phase. The initial phase begins with mediolysis of the arterial media. This slide's a little bit busy, but I'm gonna take a bit of time to explain exactly what it is. So it works from A to, to E. So initial phase A, so on the top you have the histology and on the bottom you have the CT findings. So phase A is the lysis phase. So you have lysis of the smooth muscle cells of the tunica media, which is the middle layer of the artery. Um, this gives rise to patchy transmural loss of the external elastic lamina, which is the layer between the tunica media and the outermost layer, the adventitia. This then causes the aneurysm phase. The tunica intima and the internal elastic lamina are destroyed, which means that blood, come in, blood comes in direct contact with the adventitia. This causes the vessel wall to be remodeled, remodeled and takes on an appearance similar to an aneurysm. They may have a fusiform or a saccular morphology. Following this, dissection, uh, number C, dissection and intramural hematomas then form. And going on, then you get the stenosis and thrombosis phase where granulation tissue grows within the arterial gaps leading to stenosis and thrombosis. And stage E then is where you get fibrosis. Um, and then the CT findings highlighting all of those changes are seen below. Histological diagnosis remains the gold standard to confirm the diagnosis of segmental arterial mediolysis. However, with the advancement in CT angiography and MRI, more cases are being diagnosed based on a combination of imaging and clinical criteria. This has reduced the need for an arterial biops biopsy, which is both a high risk and challenging procedure. There is no inflammatory component which distinguishes it from vasculitis. The most common finding of, on CT angiogram is dissection of the mesenteric vessels and it gives a characteristic string of beads appearance. 
Patients may present with rupture of the SMA aneurysm, which is often fatal. Imaging findings can be similar to the inflammatory vasculitis and therefore autoimmune workup should be performed to rule out such cases as was done in our case. At present, following a literature search, there's no standardized guidelines um, at present uh, for the management of these patients due to the lack of RCTs. Lifestyle modification, control of hypertension and dyslipidemia should be commenced to reduce the cardiovascular risk profile. Endovascular interventions are recommended as first-line treatment modality in patients with hemodynamic instability or evidence of end-organ ischemia. So to update you on our patient, so his superior mesenteric artery was not amenable to revascularization or a bypass procedure. He underwent an IO um, angiogram in the matter under Dr. Salati. His jejunal arteries were supplied by collaterals from the celiac axis. His inferior mesenteric artery supplied retrograde flow to the small bowel via large marginal artery. The patient himself was unable to cope with his stoma psychologically. He had a large parastomal hernia and also had an enterocutaneous fistula causing him to have many leaks. The stoma was high output and he wished to have it reversed as he was unable to work. We had multiple meetings with the patient about the surgical risk involved and the chance of a catastrophic co complication. The main concerns we had were post-operative thrombotic event, intra-abdominal complications resulting in a further bowel resection, or else an increased metabolic demand on the collateral supplying the colon resulting in either mesenteric angina or ischemia. Despite all this, he wished to proceed with the stoma reversal. He was scheduled for January 2021. However, this was cancelled due to the third wave of the pandemic. However, his stoma was reversed in Mullingar in April 2021. He, under, he had no complications and intestinal continuity was restored. He was subsequently discharged from our care. So we felt that this case highlights the difficulty in diagnosing segmental arterial mediolysis and the benefit of the multidisciplinary team. It is an important diagnosis for clinicians and radiologists to be aware of, given the, given the risks of life-threatening hemorrhage and acute organ ischemia. Here's just some of the references and thank you. Thanks very much, Zara. That's a fascinating case. Um, it's, 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 it's curious, the pathophysiology of this disease, um, and is, is it fully understood? And are there, could there be potentially manifestations in other arteries in this gentleman? Uh, yeah, there could be, um, but he has been scanned. So that, like, there is a chance he could get it again in theory, um, but most of them do occur at the same time. The, the histology and the pathophysiology is unknown. So why that lysis occurs in, in the tunica media, we don't know. We do understand then what happens afterwards. So it's not, it's not, you mentioned, <clears throat> you said it's not a vasculitis. Is that correct? No. Yeah. Okay. So we know kind of what it isn't, like we know it's not a vasculitis, it's not due to atherosclerosis and it's not immune related. Okay, so it's still a, a bit of an unknown quantity essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but appears to present like uh, ischemic bowel essentially in, in the presentation. Yeah, if it, if, if it causes a complete thrombosis or else it can either rupture, so then they, they'd have a, like a ruptured aneurysm. So, so his first presentation, he obviously didn't have a complete thrombosis, but his second one, he... He did, is that correct? Did, or? And then his third one then, he'd complete ischemia. Okay, okay. I, o I always think um, ischemic bowel is a, is a fascinating disease. It's, a, it's the poor relation of the other um, uh, arterial occlusions. You know, the, if you have an MI, an ECG very often gives you the diagnosis. If you have a stroke, you very often have a positive, you know, face uh, yeah. weakness. But ischemic bowel, unfortunately, there is no... Um, good, reliable clinical sign and very often clinical findings are absent and um, you can look for a high lactate but it's not always there. Um, so I, I always think in the future we'll be probably doing CT angios and possibly stenting arteries in the bowel in the same way as we do in the heart and the brain but there may be other reasons why that will never happen, but uh, I just think it's unfortunate uh, because uh, it is a disease which carries a very high mortality and morbidity, uh, ischemic bowel in general, and this is obviously a rare um, sort of um, Entity. condition that can present in the same way. My follow-up with that was Tim Lynch, just uh, 
I just aware obviously with Claire Fallon speaking afterwards that we think about dissections elsewhere quite frequently from a stroke viewpoint, whether vertebral arteries or carotids. So do we know, is there any, I know it's rare, but is there any follow-up on these series of these patients prone to dissections, if I use that term, elsewhere? Or is there any association with connective tissue disorders such as Marfan's or other conditions that might explain the pathogenesis? No, no, no associations with Marfan's. It's quite similar to fibromuscular dysplasia, but it's, it, it is different. Um, but that's like one of the big differential diagnoses when, when you're doing workup, but it's, it has different characteristics. Um, um, what was your other question? Sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, if there's any association with other dissections or vasculature elsewhere, or is, is it just... Yeah, so it can, it can present, uh, you can have them retroperitoneally or intracranially, and some of those images that I had up um, on this slide here, they, they're showing um, different CT, so of where, where they can occur, um, but this man didn't have any of those. Um, just... Uh, for the attendees, uh, this is obviously a Zoom webinar. It's slightly different than a Zoom call, but uh, so for you to get involved, you can either, it's probably best to, if you have a question to put it into the, Q, there's a little Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, um, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but probably the Q&A box is the best one to use and, um, or in the chat box indeed. I was just going to ask another medical question about old fashioned medicine on this one again. If I was thinking of a vasculitis, particularly the mesenteric system, uh, I'd be looking closely at the urine. Um, even the MSU sometimes gives you a nice clue. You may get red cells, the protein, and then if you spin it, you look for CAS. Uh, was the MSU, the basic urinalysis MSU, normal early on with this patient? Because that would have gone against the vasculitis, or can you remember? Oh, I had it here. So he had trace blood and one plus protein, but when we rechecked it again, it was negative. Okay. Yeah, that so, was just on his very initial presentation. Fair enough, yeah. Sometimes you have to ask specifically our renal colleagues to do the old spin to look for casts and that, you know, with that, if you get a bit of blood and protein, you wonder, if, well, is there some involvement of vasculitis that sometimes can be very useful because it's vasculitis of gut and indeed elsewhere, and including neuro axis, is very difficult to pin down. It's one of our conditions that drives us potty because we can't fully exclude it even with good cerebral angiography, you can still have it because it can be quite patchy. And that this is the problem, I think, with vascular like this, and I'm sure the same applies with the mesenteric system, as you've highlighted, because you may get a segment, but proximally or distally, you may have the pathology and you may just have missed it by a prior chance at the time of resection. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Zara, can I ask a question there? Sorry, Thomas. Uh, Zara, Shane O'Hanlon here, geriatrician. Uh, just wondering about the double barrel stoma, because uh, we, we've all heard of the end in the loop, stomas, but I, I wasn't very familiar with that. Would you be able to give us a quick yeah. explanation of how that works? Yeah, uh, so we brought, so this was done in the Mattis, they brought out one loop of this ascending colon, uh, so lacked as a, mucus to, as a mucus fistula just to allow drainage. Tomas, it, it's okay. here, um, I might comment on that. Yeah, he, he had a really good operation at that stage by Professor Stokes and his team. You know, they resected what they needed to resect. All too often the ileostomy is brought out and the, the end of the colon is left closed over inside and that would have subjected this man to a laparotomy to restore his continuity. But by bringing out both ends and stitching the back wall together and having two lumens on the surface, this essentially was a loop ileostomy reversal, which really made it technically much easier and much less of a surgical insult for him. I think we uh, would have balked much more doing a laparotomy on this man rather than just reversing an ileostomy for him. Mm -hmm. Yes, and is it common that you'd see people with issues like that with the stoma, you know, that, that degree of difficulty with adjusting to it? Yeah, so he, he, the other thing they did was they, they very helpfully measured what small bowel they left behind. So we knew he had two meters of small bowel, which is going to result in a, quite a high output stoma. It's enough to maintain your nutrition and your hydration, but only with high doses of Imodium. And you have to be careful with your hypotonic uh, drinks. Um, but yeah, it would be quite common for them to have high output. The other issue was he did have a tiny fistula. I, I suspect they, there was a three point stitch done to make sure the stoma was spouted and it caused just a pinhole, but it was coming out right at the junction of the mucosa and the skin. And so every time you put a bag on, this little leak would undermine under the seal of the bag and cause it to lift and cause a leak. Um, so, so that was another factor in deciding to go ahead and reverse them. So Desmond, asked, <laughs> one bag goes over the double uh, lumen coming out, is that right? Yeah, it looks just like a loop ileostomy. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so it's much easier to close then, Des, presumably? Oh, oh much easier. It, it, it's a 45-minute operation rather than a full laparotomy. Uh, well, it's AC, the nice little hernia and a bit of prolapse, which means nature's already done the mobilization for you. Uh, so we were quite confident we wouldn't have to go into his belly to reverse this. Wow, okay. That's very interesting. And is that, is that becoming more standard practice nowadays, or does it depend on the geographical location of the bowel resection? Yeah, well, it depends on the, on the location. You know, in, in this case, it was only the cecal pole was ischemic, so the acin in colon reaches out quite nicely in the right iliac fossa. But if you'd had to go back to the middle colic sort of area in the transverse colon, then you'd probably end up leaving that inside or bringing it out as a mucophysia at a different site. And so, unfortunately, those patients then end up needing uh, a full laparotomy to bring the two ends together. Um, and normally when you reconnect then, do, are they still prone to the same kind of diarrhea um, issues? Um... Uh, well, so he had, you know, 95% of his colon intact. And yeah. the main function of that colon is to reabsorb water. Um, he's two meters of small bowel, there's plenty for nutrition. So he was fine. The issue with him is because he's lost his ileum, is going to be bile salt diarrhea which we manage with uh, cholestyramine and also we to watch his B12 going forward because he won't absorb B12 now for the rest of his life. So he'll have to have IM supplements of that a couple of times a year. Okay. And does it, or is there, could I ask, is there any chance it was related to COVID? Um, I don't think so. His initial presentation, as far as I remember, was kind of March 2019. It was right at the very start of COVID. Um, and we hadn't seen very much of it at all at that stage, so I don't think so. And sorry if you mentioned, but would he go on something for some sort of secondary prevention after this, aspirin or statins? Yeah, he's on, yeah, he's on aspirin. Yeah. Okay, he's on aspirin. thanks very much. And he has all his cardiovascular risk factors modified. I don't know what causes this, but it seems to affect kind of the origins of the main aortic branches. Um, and so you, you've got to wonder, is it, is it kind of a, a shear effect or something like that? Um, you know, he was hypertensive, he's a smoker. Although it's not atherosclerotic, is it something related to that? The only thing against that is it can often affect patients at multiple arteries at the same time, which will go against it being a, a some sort of a, a stress or force effect. Okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, thanks. That's a, that, that's a fascinating case. And uh, thanks very much for that. If there are no further questions, we'll move on to our second case. Okay, so um, next is under medicine, and uh, we're having Dr. Yule, who I think is presenting with Professor Claire Fallon. Uh, Dr. Yule wisely did neuroscience and undergraduate degree before moving into her training, uh, as she's figured out the brain is important, and I'm biased in that factor. I think this case is a good example. Many times we're discussed, blamed as a neurologist making diagnoses and not treating much. I think that's changed. So she'll be presenting with uh, Professor Fallon, who's interested in stroke, dementia, and movement disorders, and in particular education. And there's the RCSI, BST, HST trainer, trainer in Mullingar, and the uh, Dean of Undergraduate Training in Mullingar. And then Shane Smith is backing that up, my colleague here in the matter, and in Mullingar. Shane is a uh, neurologist, particularly interested in peripheral nerve and neuromuscular disorders, but obviously does a lot of general neurology and acute stroke and works very hard. Looking forward to this presentation. You want to share your screen, Jess? Just before Jess presents, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their collaboration on this case. And it's a, as Tim said, it's a huge example of the collaboration and the efforts and the resources that are needed to, I suppose, diagnose and, and rehabilitate a patient. So across the, the hospital here, across the two ICUs and across the Department of Neurology and then Rehabilitation Medicine and Pharmacy. Um, Jess is presenting because she was actually involved in this gentleman's care, uh, both uh, in the matter before he was transferred here and uh, has been doing a lot of neurology here with Dr. Smith um, previously. Uh, if Tom, to Tomas, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so really all I wanted to highlight for this case is the, you know, the difficulties that can arise after what is described as a simple fall. Uh, patient presents to the emergency department here on general take. This is a 78 year old single gentleman who was working very actively as a farmer. Um, no significant background history and never in hospital before. 
the only reason he came to the hospital was that he could not continue to carry his bags of, of meal and feed for his cattle. Uh, the first fall was when he felt the bag was too heavy for him on one occasion. And the next week he fell against a gate and actually had to crawl his way up the gate. Again, he felt he had stumbled on something um, and his GP two, do, two days before admission had referred him into the uh, x-ray department for hip and shoulder x-rays after the first fall and then he was subsequently admitted. There are a lot of investigations listed here and really I've just listed them here before Jess mentions them to show the, the number of investigations and the rapidity that we can access a lot of images uh, and, and investigations here in, in Mullingar. Um, our MRI is out of house, so there are arrangements with Tullamore or the private hospital locally to access that. But you can see from here that he was admitted on the 18th and his imaging happened reasonably quickly in that context. Um, so I'm just going to hand over. To, uh, and the other issue I'd like to highlight here is that this gentleman was cognitively extremely uh, sharp. And prior to his uh, rapid deterioration, he, he had very clear conversations with both myself and Shane about levels of care, ceilings of care, and you know what, what would be done. So he sold his cattle before he deteriorated. So on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Jess with thanks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation. My name's Jess. I'm a current SHO in Mullingar and was previously working in the matter under neurology and ED. Um, I'd like to present um, a case of a particularly rare or new finding of a neurofashion antibody positive patient. Um, but I'll just go into his initial presentation. So I have a 78 year old male who presented mid November of last year to Mullingar Hospital with two unwitness falls as Prof Allen explained. He described his legs having gone weak and becoming unable to support him. Following his second fall, he was found on the ground by his neighbour and brought to hospital. His medical history includes hypercholesterolemia, left cataract surgery six years ago, glaucoma to the left eye and ex-smoker and usually independent at baseline. He had been farming up until the week of his admission. A week previously, he had been driving home and felt his hands were slightly weak on the steering wheel. The following day, he felt his legs were weak for the first time. This weakness progressively worsened. Power in all limbs deteriorated rapidly after his admission. And initially his weakness was most profound in the proximal muscles. And so he was investigated for myositis. Over the weekend of his admission in Mullingar, his condition worsened and he was placed on neuro ops and peak flow measurements. On examination, five days into his admission, he had flaccid paralysis of the lower limbs and moderate to severe bilateral weakness in his upper limbs. He had reduced light touch and vibration sensation up to the level of his ACES and reduced proprioception bilaterally. He was hyperreflexic and had a mute right plantar and a downgoing left plantar reflex. This progressed over the next few days. So in terms of investigations, he had an MRI brain and spine which only showed mild cerebral atrophy with moderate cervical and lumbar spondylosis. His CT tap showed no evidence of malignancy and his LP showed a raised protein of 1.2 with normal red cell count, white cell count and glucose. He was seen by our consultant neurologist, Dr. Smith, who had a working diagnosis um, initially of acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. It was on day five of his admission that it was advised he be given a five day course of IVIG of two grams per kilogram per day. There was an initial improvement in power with a three out of five power in the upper limb and a four out of five power in the lower limb. This plateaued for five days after which the physiotherapist became concerned that the patient's power had worsened with his peak flows downtrending. A further five day course of IVIG was, was commenced. Day three of the second course of IVIG, which was day 17 of his admission, he had lost respiratory effort and was admitted to ICU and intubated. There was also a drop of hemoglobin from 12 to eight, thought likely to be due to a reaction to the IVIG. 
due to the refractory nature of the presentation and the severity of his deterioration, Dr. Smith advised that antinodal antibodies be sent to the lab from Mullingar. I'll be explaining these um, antibodies in a few slides. After further deterioration and minimal improvement in power, he was sent to the matter for plasmapheresis after getting three days of methylpred in Mullingar, and he had EMG studies 23 days into his admission. So neuro, the neurophysiology cannot reliably distinguish between the classic Guillain-Barré syndrome and from um, CIDP. Both would have patchy de demyelinating neuropathy or slowing of conduction velocity, predominantly motor with conduction block. This wasn't exactly um, the classic EMG finding. So the patient was then admi administered the methyl prednisolone for three days in Mullingar and then transferred to the matter where he had the six sessions of plasma phoresis, where there was no dramatic improvement again. Um, so this is just a brief timeline of um, first symptom onset as day one. And you can see it's a very rapidly deteriorating um, picture with respiratory arrest and intubation on day 23 from symptom onset. A blood sample had been sent to the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences in, in Oxford uh, to test for paranodal and nodal antibodies. The sampling contained IgG antibodies which cross-reacted with neurofashion 155, as you can see on the, the middle left, and neurofashion 186. The pattern of reactivity shown here is typically associated with aggressive and extremely severe neuropathy with frequent cases including cranial, autonomic and respiratory involvement. Just a brief explanation of the anatomy of neuron um, and the node and paranode. So each internode in case in a myelin is encased in a myelin sheath. Uh, this is flanked by nodes of Ranvier seen in purple on the left here. The nodes are where the axolemma are most exposed to extracellular fluid, and thus these aid saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction is the leaping-like propagation of action potentials along myelinated axons from one node of Ranvier to the next, increasing the conduction velocity of action potentials. The molecular architecture within the nodal region of axons reflect their function to initiate, maintain, and control conduction, and this depends on specialized axoglial Detections. Detection of autoantibodies in the serum of a patient targeted against these nodes and paranodal areas of an axon can be associated with particularly severe cases of acquired peripheral neuropathies. And knowledge of these biomarkers may guide future treatment and prognosis. These cases can result in devastating neurological deficits, including paralysis, sensory loss, autonom autonomic disturbances, and respiratory failure. Guillain-Barré syndrome and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CIDP, encompasses the majority of these immune-mediated neuropathies. The atypical features discovered in the autoimmune targeting of these particular domains within the axonal nodes and paranodes have also shown to respond poorly to certain standard therapies, hence the importance of their detection. Here is a closer look at a at the various interactions between molecules and channels around a node of Ranvier. I won't go into too much detail, um, but as you can see in purple and a lighter pink, we have the neurofashion 186, which, which is in the node, and we have neurofashion 155, which is in the paranodal area. So they're both um, very important for saltatory conduction. Peripheral neuropathies are classified as primarily demyelinating or axonal. Microstructural alterations of the nodal region are the key to understanding the pathophysiology of these neuropathies. Such as in our case today, antibodies targeting specific molecules within this delicate hemostasis can lead to significant deleterious effects. And here um, in one of the papers it shows um, the likely phenotypes um, with present positive antibodies such as neurofashion 186 and neurofashion 155 circled here. As you can see in the paranodal antibody section for neurofashion 155, um, you see that there are raised CSF protein levels as in our case with 
a good response to rituximab and often not a good response for IVIG, which was Sarah and Alke. This is just a paper published by Dr. Rinaldi in Oxford um, and Prof. Delanti in the matter with uh, Dr. Tudor collaborated with this. Um, it's to look at the mortality um, differing between treatments with IVIG or rituximab in patients positive for neurofashion antibodies. It just um, highlights that um, the patients positive for the neurofashion antibodies were more clinically responsive to treatments with rituximab rather than the use of IVIG. Now, this is a limited number of uh, subjects we used in this study, um, obviously, because this is still quite new, um, but there's room for further, further um, trials. So back to our patient, um, he was given the usual induction of rituximab, uh, which was carried out in the matter on day 53 and day 64. He was then transferred back to Monagar on NIV via Traki, which was capped a month later after significant improvement, and this was then removed. He was then transferred to St. Mary's Rehab on the 4th of March, approximately day 105 um, after symptom onset. He had clinic follow-up with um, Prof. Allen, and he had a brief admission in May with a UTI where he remained well. And his next dose of rituximab was given on the 11th of August of this year, and this had to be timed so that his second COVID vaccine was approximately two weeks prior to the third rituximab dose. He is now currently mobilizing independently, living alone and with good support again from his neighbors. And he gets a care in Monday to Friday and meals on wheels twice a week and he's doing very well. Um, I might just ask if anyone has any questions or any questions to Prof Allen or Dr. Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that presentation. That was um, excellent. Um, so I just want to make a comment, I suppose, and we've seen the president come through. I, I think um, in our area, neuroscience and neuro, in neuroimmunology has gone really crazy in the last 10 years uh, with an array of different antibodies, both for peripheral disorders and central um, ranging. And many of these are treatable. <clears throat> so it's in a range of disorders that we actually weren't able to diagnose in the past, nor indeed treat. Um, so this is something we have to get a get a knowledge of because they do come into, into hospital, they could do come into casualty. And it's a good example of, you know, if some patient's falling rather than just accepting that he's an older man who had a fall, what is the cause of the fall? And then hunting it down in this fashion is a great example. The other comment I wish to make is that people should be aware, I talk about the Irish mafia in the Mayo Clinic. Um, so there are Irish, four Irish graduates who run the neuroimmunology department of the Mayo Clinic in the States which is the big neuroimmunology department in the States. It does a battery of oral antibody testing for neurological disorders. Sean Pittick being the senior person, Oliver Tobin, Andrew McKeown and Owen Flanagan, many of which trained actually here in the matter and elsewhere. So it's a great asset actually, sometimes when you're struggling with these and you want to send some funny wacky antibodies and get some more detailed analysis, either via Oxford. And there's a chap called Paddy Waters who runs the lab, he's an Irish, Cork graduate who runs a lab in Oxford and what often you do is when you send these results and you're not you think it's not quite fitting what you expect it's often an email to Paddy who then can go and look at a bit more detail because the initial analysis is often a radioimmune assay and sometimes what you want actually in neurology is a routine cell-based assay where you layer the patient's serum against tissue and use an anti-idiotype in other words an antibody to antibody fluorescein system to see actually is there a generic general antibody in there that then you've got to hunt down so paddy will do that in case that people are very suspicious of so there's a couple of key contexts to these labs and it often requires like everything in medicine quite a bit of an iterative discussion process with the lab to get these right nice presentation thank you for that yeah and uh guillain -Barre and uh, related syndromes are, are not as rare as um as we think, I suspect, you know, they are rare, uh, but certainly not something you see in the emergency department every day. So, and uh, we have been caught out by these cases in the early stages um, because the symptoms can be quite vague in the early stages and the, you know, clinical findings can be a, a bit subjective. And sometimes you get atypical presentations with unusual symptoms. 
and uh, pain as well uh, as a feature you know um, you can get people presenting with a lot of pain initially which can be ascribed to you know sort of musculoskeletal pain um, there is one hand raised Paul Gallagher has his hand raised so I was going to uh, if Paul if you want to unmute yourself you should be able to while Paul is figuring that one out, I might just comment further on uh, just Tomas's comment there. I, I think he's absolutely right. They talk about Ian Bray being about a one in a million. It's not. We see it much more frequently than that. And most of the neurology units around the city and around the country often have one or two patients at any given moment. So I think it's much more common. I think the spectrum of disease probably is broader. It comes in with mild symptoms that can often be missed, as Tomas said. The back pain is quite characteristic, sometimes early on in patients, and often they will have sensory complaints. So thinking about Guillain-Barre is purely motor, it can get you caught out. It's predominantly motor, but you'll often have some sensory complaints, as this patient had, I think he had some proprioception losses, I would suggest there at the time. And um, so you've got to keep a broader open mind in it. I think the key thing about this patient actually is that the first thing we do in neurology when you approach somebody, a patient, is you think of where is the problem? In other words, where in the system is this problem? This patient is falling. So somebody comes in with a fall, is it brain, brainstem, spinal cord, nerve root, plexus, peripheral nerve, nerve muscle junction, and muscle. And falls can be anywhere in that pathway. So you really got to hunt it down. So your neurologic history and exam is key here. And that back to the old fashioned medicine of lower motor versus upper motor is key. And I noticed he was flaccid. So straight away, you're hunting into a peripheral system, excluding a lot of the other central causes of falling, like Parkinson's, and you're hunting down that peripheral neuropathy. And then after that is where, what is the problem? And unfortunately in neurology, we have a battery and array, a huge number of differential diagnoses. And neuropathy is no exception to that. So Shane Smith chose a tough subspecialty because the list of neuropathies is vast. There's an excellent website that I think it may be helpful to people, which is very detailed in Washington University in the state of St. Louis. So the Wash U University website has got all neuropathies sitting down, including acquired and um, inherited. And that's actually a very good resource sometimes when you look at causes of, because unfortunately, again, neuropathy like this can be an inherited, infected, nutritional, endocrine, degenerative, allergic, trauma-based, immunological-based, tumor-based, paraneoplastic based iatrogenic, a good old drug is giving this quite commonly, renal-based, et cetera. So you have to work down through that vitamin list that you all have to figure out what is the possible cause. And in this case, obviously, a rare cause of guillain a relapsing cause, but treatable, so important. Jim, can I ask you a question there, actually, Shane O'Hanlon here again. Claire, I might ask you just about the fact that he sold his cattle. Was that a snap decision that he made himself um, or was that following advice and guidance from the team that this was a severe illness and he was unlikely to get back to that level of functioning? It was, I suppose, it was a, jo it was a joint uh, discussion really, Shane. Um, he was a, he's a very articulate, very bright gentleman who, you know, I suppose if for anybody that would meet him now would think he's, a, he's an older gentleman, slightly stooped and arthritic but uh, a very, you know, very keen mind and he knew he was unwell and we were able to talk to him about that. And I suppose while he had a rapid deterioration, um, he was very aware that he had lived alone. His neighbours were very supportive. So, I mean, I had discussions with him about, you know, are you sure you want to sell your cattle? And he was able to tell me, well, I'll sell them now. I won't get as good a price for them as if, you know, as if I was here in, this was December. So he would have preferred to sell them in February or March. But it was a very clear discussion about that. But it was also a very clear discussion about, you know, he could deteriorate from a respiratory point of view. Did he want to be intubated? Would he like to be transferred to the matter? Um, he had a brother and a niece living in Kilkenny where he went on discharge from rehab. Um, and I spoke to his, I think his niece, and I'm, I think Shane spoke to them as well. So Shane and I had actually had a discussion about, separately about these issues with this gentleman before he, um, he's finally deteriorated and uh, needed uh, respiratory support. So it was one of those, certainly from my point of view, it's one of those really rewarding cases. And even the greater discussion about should this gentleman be intubated if he deteriorates? We didn't have the antibodies back at that stage. I mean, this is something I knew nothing about really before this gentleman's case. It's, it, for me, it was genuinely a fall into the unknown, which is why I chose the title for that. Um, so I think, 
there's a lot of questions about the, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, if these if nodal antibodies weren't available, this gentleman wouldn't have received the prolonged expensive treatment that he has that he has received. He wouldn't be at home with a very good quality of life. And I probably wouldn't have had the faith to persist with treatment, nor would any of my colleagues. So I think it raises, I'd raise my hand there. It raises the other point that the value of having in-house neurology and very dedicated liaison rather than as you know, Tim, I know Tim and colleagues over the years, you know, it's picking up the phone, it's nearly a personal um, favor. And, you know, it's the, the Christmas Eve calls with the difficult, uh, the difficult patients to transfer. So it's the value of having the regular neurology input and the, the pathways of, of care transfer. And, and also our ICU staff, our, my ICU colleagues here have extremely good uh, relationships with the ICU colleagues in the matter who over the years have, you know, have accept transfers and, and, you know, facilitate care of patients here. So it is very much a pathway um, of care, but the, the regular neurology support um, is really vital. And I know it's a, a different discussion for a different day, but I think that has to be emphasized in a case like this, that the rare cases do crop up quite commonly. And Shane might like to comment. I have another gentleman who Shane has seen recently, maybe a CIDP Guillain-Barre uh, variant. So it's not uncommon. You know, these are complex patients and the issues, not just the neurology issues, but the, the I suppose the living and the life and dying discussions are also very complex. Um, but this was a particularly rewarding gentleman to deal with actually. So. Yeah. Thanks for being clear. This is Shane here, Shane Smith. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah um, th thanks to Jess for presenting um, and to Claire. Uh, yeah, this fellow is, was, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's quite got to the point where we're checking these antibodies in everybody, but it'll probably go that way. Um, you know, still, I think most Guillain-Barre we see is just standard Guillain-Barre syndrome. Most CIDP we see is still standard CIDP. But um, as I say, I think it'll go, it'll become a thing that we just check these routinely. And it's, if you're going to check them, it is actually important to check them before you get treatment. Um, this guy syndromically was still Guillain-Barre syndrome. You know, he came in, it was quick. He got flaccid uh, quadriparesis um, and he got severe autonomic dysfunction with, with respiratory failure. Um, the, the, you can get a, you can get a, what is termed a treatment related fluctuation, which is a, a dip again in the patient's um, status days, even weeks later. And that's said to occur in about five to 10% of of people, I've, I'm not sure if I've formally labeled someone as having a treatment related fluctuation in the past, but you tend to, so patients can dip again with Guillain-Barre syndrome and you tend to give them another course of, of treatment, you, you know, typically IVIG uh, or plasma exchange would be another treatment. But so the, the first time this man got worse, I actually would say his response to IVIG and plasma exchange was was good. Uh, maybe I'm remembering it badly, but I thought it was pretty good. It's just that it was extremely short lived. That was the, that was the problem. So when he had his first dip, the um, my feeling was well, I guess maybe this is just a treatment related fluctuation. But it was the it was the recurrent uh, worsening, which was which was unusual. And um, you know, CIDP, which is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, that is by its nature a chronic relapsing uh, condition, but while you can, can get an acute onset CIDP, you don't get autonomic involvement in respiratory failure with CIDP, but minor, minor, minor stuff, but you really don't get that. So syndromically, this guy, you, have, you would have to label him as Guillain-Barre syndrome, and you probably have to label him as relapsing Guillain-Barre syndrome, which in some ways is a paradox. It, it's, it's really a monophasic illness. Um, but that was the reason for the um, for checking these antibodies or, or for thinking about them because it was it was a severe recurrent um, relapsing Guillain-Barre syndrome, so a very unusual phenotype. Um, and uh, yeah, that, so that, that was really um, really just what I wanted to say about about the the syndrome. Again, I'm not uh, I'm not routinely checking these in everybody, but I, I think it probably will be heading that way. Uh, just a question: How is he doing now? Do we know? Did he? How much of his power and function did he regain? And what? And generally, what's the prognosis with uh, these type of cases? Um, sorry, you go ahead, Claire. Sorry. From a practical point of view, he's really well. He's mobilizing. He uses a stick. He is independent with most with his personal care. He does have some home health and care coming in. But I think had you know that is something he may have 
developed towards anyway at this age. Um, he walked into clinic, he was very chatty. And on the last day we had asked him previously about uh, presenting his case, I think, and might have been discussed with him in the mat or at some stage or, or um, and he called me back to say, do I have to go anywhere? Do I'm, I, I wouldn't like to go on stage, but I'm happy to, for you to tell my story. <laughs> and uh, so he's, he's really well actually. And he came in for his, um, set his third dose of rituximab in August, August yeah. and is extremely well. He's not due back to clinic. Yeah, and uh, Tomas, appar uh, apparently with these conditions, sometimes you, there can be, even if there's, there's, I believe, even months before they get a dose of rituximab, they can still pick up even if they're treated late. Um, I think the, the, pa the, the patient that um, Professor Delante had and Tudor, one of our SPORs, was seeing that patient um, I think that patient was well into his admission uh, in Beaumont before he actually got rituximab, and I think did very well. Um, well, I guess I thought of these antibodies. Actually, Tudor, uh, who was working in the matter at the time under SBO, was a very astute guy. He, um, he he was telling me about the Beaumont case and was talking about rituximab, so that kind of helped me uh, um, kind of think about giving him that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think as, as long as it gets treated, uh, the prognosis is fine. But I, it does make you wonder if some of the patients who ultimately uh, die from Guillain-Barre syndrome, because it does have a mortality rate, uh, you know, it's not, not zero. And um, maybe they have these, maybe they have or have had these uh, conditions and, and collectively we've kind of, you know, said, oh, well, unfortunately they're gone, we're, nothing we can do. Um, and it makes you wonder if, um, if we got in earlier with medication, would they be? Uh, would they have survived? You know, has there been an increase in this with COVID in this in these type of conditions? Not that I've noticed. Uh, well, there was there was a kind of a sense that Guillain-Barré syndrome might be more common for a while. I'm not too sure if that's really been borne out. But Guillain-Barré syndrome has been associated with COVID. But then again, everything's being associated with COVID. Uh, I can't really get a sense that that these. Uh, antibodies are, are more common in, in the COVID era, and I, I haven't seen anything about that in the literature. Okay. Uh, I just want to launch a quick poll for everybody who's on. Uh, it should come up now, just what is your job? And if you just pick one of the, um, uh, you should be able to choose one of the options there. If everybody can do it, that'd be great if you can on your phone or on your... Um... Just on a side note as well, um, just the slide I have up here. Um, one of the patients we were seeing uh, with Dr. Smith, one of uh, Prof. Allen's patients, actually had some pain associated with his weakness. And if you see at the bottom here, um, the Casper 2 is associated with neuropathic pain. So it's a nice table to kind of look at the phenotypes and, and look at the potential antibodies um, uh, linked to them. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just sharing the results there. And uh, just, just one more uh, quick poll. Um, if I can just close this one, apologies. I don't, I don't see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Tim, Tim Paul Gallagher here, if I may. Um, just while that's going up. The, uh, the choice of rituximab, just out of interest, is that unique specifically for this particular patient or is this a standard treatment for CIDP? The reason I ask is I, I have a, a, a close relative with CIDP. And it is complicated by rheumatoid, um, familial rheumatoid disease. And is, is rituximab just unique for this particular patient or would there be other treatment options? Um, I, I can, can you hear me? I, I can uh, yeah. uh, answer that, I think. Um, I mean, mo most CIDP, to be honest, um, if you can get away with the standard therapies, which, which often uh, work, um, they, I think they should be pursued. So uh, CIDP as opposed to Guillain-Barre syndrome, you, typically, I'm talking about, you know, regular CIDP in inverted commas, should respond well to steroids. So, um, mm. uh, you know, it's usually you know, steroids, plasma exchange, uh, IVIG, and uh, so it's maintenance IVIG or steroids or both. 
Um, you know, there's no one regimen for anyone with CIDP. Plasma exchange, maintenance plasma exchange is occasionally done. It's very hard to do in this country, but uh, that actually can work quite well. You know, some patients are on, let's say, IVIG with steroids and azathioprine or CELSEP. So there, there's not there's not really one regimen. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're talk, if, if someone was, um, yeah, I have I have tried. Um, there's a patient. Um, uh, she's she's in at the moment um, with actually another condition, but she has bad CIDP. She's she needs IVIG every week with steroids. She's hugely dependent on it. And I even checked these antibodies in her because I thought like, well, this is just she's so dependent on it. They were negative. Um, unless it's an effective treatment. But I tried rituximab on her. She got three doses of it and it didn't help. So right. I think if someone's really struggling with CIDP and, and you know, you're, you've tried the conventional stuff, um, again, as an aside, I probably would check these antibodies. But uh, if, if, if things aren't working as they should, I think it's reasonable to try rituximab. Uh, you know, this cyclophosphamide, I suppose I've never used that in CIDP, but rituximab seems to be a much cleaner drug uh, I think it's worth trying. Doesn't always work from from what I can see, but it, but people do try it. Um, right. in, in and and just, yeah. just one last question: With this particular case that was presented, and thanks, it was really interesting. Uh, will this gentleman, um, Claire, would you anticipate that he'd be on rituximab forever, or what's the treatment regime for this gentleman? So the recommendation is, uh, Paul, that he uh, he'll receive the rituximab at six monthly intervals, and that right. will. Be um, rituximab. It's actually an off. It's an off-label use of the drug. Um, so we discussed at our our um, drugs and therapeutics uh, governance committee, and it's you know the hospital has approved it, and it's uh, we were fortunate at the time because of the pandemic. Um, the other person who was involved in his care was Dr. Colin McGee, who's a rheumatologist who had mm -hmm. quite a lot of facility with, with rituximab and its use. So he was able to advise at the time, and I think spoke with Shane and and some of the others involved. So our our ward structure was somewhat different, so there were a lot of different consultants and a lot of that very helpful. Um, Super. Yeah. Thanks very much, Claire. Thanks, everybody. I might just cover that a bit further. I think it. Um, the, we often think about these. That's rituximab as a B cell agent, and we sometimes use T cell agents for other purposes. So we're often able to figure out actually the mechanism of the antibody. Uh, some of the paraneoplastic antibodies actually are markers. They don't really actually, they may be for internal antigens of the cells. So they may not respond to the B cell mechanism and phoresis, whereas some of the more peripheral ones on the surface of the lead cells may, may benefit. But it does highlight a gap we have within the system. We are short immunology. So actually, if I was starting to train now, then we would have a hard look at immunology because we could do with an immunologist actually often to work closely with us to try and pick and select the correct drug because we've an increasing array of B and T cell mediated drugs to use. And sometimes you're trying to, you, it's your trial and error approach to it rather than perhaps more science. And the second point I would make is, as just touched upon by Claire, these are off label drugs because these are rare disorders. And we do fall foul of that. And Shane's done that a few times, you know, with our drugs and therapeutic committee in the matter of rejecting patients for Tuximab when we've no other option. And that actually puts us in a very difficult medical position because these are rare disorders we're at the cutting edge of medical medication and neuroimmunology and sometimes it is trial and error and it may be worthwhile but sometimes then we, we get a block in and there's no funding made available for the drug. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, we're just past nine o'clock so uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters, all the speakers uh, for presenting those very interesting cases which showed great examples of you know inter-hospital um, collaboration to um, you know treat these complex cases and um, so it's really which is really what uh, you know being in a hospital group is, a, is about so I think that's um, you know really good to see that really encouraging to see that so um, thanks very much to everybody Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, please spare the word. More support, more attendance. I think these are great sessions. Again, as, as the Moss highlighted, uh, that uh, communication between hospitals, I think, is key here. And as Claire pointed out, I think these appointments, when you often have people appointed both to the matter and maybe Vince's and with the Mullingar, Letkenny, Kilkenny, or Wexford, these are very important appointments, particularly in subspecialty areas, perhaps like neurology and other areas, uh, because I think they're key. Thanks for everybody for the attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.